Hello and welcome to another edition of the Harrogate Podcast with me, Andrew Gray. Today I welcome back Guy Phoenix. Guy was on a previous podcast in which we discussed uh, cybercrime and uh, so on. But today I'm going to talk about Guy Phoenix, the business person. Now, when I met Guy for the first time back in March, I really was blown away by his background. It was most unusual, fascinating, and I came away with sort of four or five pages of notes of things I wanted to ask him about, hence we arranged another podcast today. But when thinking how I can describe Guy, and he's sort of sniggering at me, just trying to work out how to describe him, I would describe him as international man of mystery, although he doesn't like that. i describe him as a workaholic, although I don't think he likes that either. And I'd also describe him as a playaholic, which I know he really doesn't like. But he's a business person. He's sort of local and yet international. He's worked for mega organizations like Rolls-Royce, but he's also owns smaller IT companies. And he's told me recently that he's bought a new IT company in Leeds. Congratulations. But Guy, I've done my best to describe you, but I don't think I've done it justice. How would you describe you to my listeners? <laughs> It's a, thanks very much for that, Andrew, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here again, and thank you for inviting me back. That, that's, I really don't know how to answer that question, quite honestly. I'm, I'm just like anybody else is trying to make their way through life and find their way through life. I'm, I'm not, not even sure now if I'm, if I'm doing it right half a century in, quite frankly. But it seems so, like it's going pretty well to me. And you're being humble as well, and, as I, miss some, and I miss something out, but you've written the book entitled Two Funerals about your experience of Hurricane Irma in the British Virgin Islands. <clears throat> and you're in the middle of writing a book with the working title of Get Up as well. So you're an author as well as the International Man of Mystery. Is that fair to describe you as an, an author? <laughs> I'm not at all sure, sure it is. We'll, we'll see about that. I think it's for, for others to judge. Hurricane Irma and my book Two Funerals, although it's published, I didn't make it available for sale because it was such a personal, an intense personal experience that I've only given the book to close personal friends to convey to them what it was like because it's actually practically impossible to put it into words. So that was really my first foray into writing. They've all told me they like it, but then they would because they're friends and family. So I thought, because the book fell out of me, it encouraged me to think, well, I'll write a proper book. And I've decided I will write it on my experience of the past 10 years of uh, moving to the British Virgin Islands and everything that's, that's gone on and happened since then. And the working title, as you say, is Get Up, because there have been several challenges on numerous occasions where I have frankly felt poleaxed, and the next day you get up. Perfect. Well, let's get to the beginning of Guy Phoenix. Born in Worcestershire, I think but then moved over to Dubai as a seven-year-old. Tell us about your early years of your life. Sure. I was, I was born in Kidderminster in West Midlands, Worcestershire. My mum and dad's house was in Bewdley, so I was brought up, brought up in Bewdley as a, as a child, went to infant school there and also the junior school. All pretty normal stuff so far. Yeah, absolutely normal. Although in those days I was allowed to walk to, walk to school on my own. <laughs> yeah, nice times, good times. Then it was during the 70s and the economic times were tough in the UK. There was a construction boom going on in the Middle East. My dad was in the construction industry and he took the decision to take himself, my mum and me and our dog out to Dubai, which is, for those of you listening, your listeners who've been to Dubai recently, is unrecognisable from the Dubai that I was brought up in, which was basically a sand pit. Until your dad helped to construct many he, of those he, tower blocks. One of many expatriates who, uh, who was yeah, in charge of uh, building, the, yeah, building buildings. And so therefore you were schooled in, I imagine, an international school. That's correct, yeah. So um, I went to the newly opened Jumeirah English Speaking School uh, as my first school there. And then after a couple of years, uh, the reasons I can't remember why I moved, I think it might have just been because of the age group that Jess could, could deal with. I moved to a brand new school called Dubai College. Uh, not so new now, of course, but I went to as one of the first students at Dubai College. And you weren't doing the GCSEs O levels route. So it was the is it International Baccalaureate? I think you studied. That, that's right. In in later years, uh, we actually moved to Abu Dhabi when I went to Shwefat International School, which is a Lebanese school, and that's where I took the International Baccalaureate. 
and maybe explaining why I describe you as an international man of mystery. Because it seems like your schooling has really had an impact upon you know, where you've chosen to live and to work through your life. Is, would that be fair to say? It, it absolutely would. I think when I got my first job after university, I, I set out my stall with all of my employers to say, I really want to work overseas. And so that was undoubtedly driven by the fact that I had lived overseas in the Middle East for uh, nearly nine years as a child. And where was university? I went to the University of Nottingham. So and what did you study? I did a joint honours degree in electronic engineering and mathematics. And yeah, by the way, University of Nottingham, when you sell it as a 50-50 degree, yeah, no, <laughs> it was more like 80-80. So I actually had to work at university, unlike most of my friends. <laughs> but it's worked out nicely for you. And dare I ask what grade that you got at Nottingham? I achieved a first class honours degree. Wow, there aren't many of those. And they certainly didn't hand them out in that many, you know, whatever years you went to university. So what year would you have graduated? 1989. Well done, first class honours degree in two subjects, essentially. I'm, uh, I'm not sure of anyone else on the Harriet podcast who's uh, in your intellectual capacity or, or qualifications, perhaps I'm being, doing a disservice to those who've already been interviewed. But so from university then, with this fantastic degree, what was your sort of first venture into the world of work? I joined, I first joined a company in Nottingham, which was a joint venture between GEC and Plessy Telecommunications as a software engineer. I, I didn't enjoy the job. And so after a year, I a, applied for and, uh, and, was, and got a job at Rolls-Royce PLC, then spent the next 10 years of my career. Probably one of the coolest companies I would have thought you could work for. Now, my understanding is that there's sort of two sections to Rolls-Royce. There's the Rolls-Royce of the the cars with the celebrities in them sure. and so forth. But then there's also the, the more interesting bit of Rolls-Royce, which I think you worked in. What did your element or side of Rolls-Royce do? Uh, sure, well, well Rolls-Royce PLC is, is Rolls-Royce. Interesting, interesting fact, well, interesting to me, but your, your, your listeners might think it's not, not that interesting. Uh, Rolls-Royce Motor Company is not part of Rolls-Royce PLC. And in fact, my understanding, and it might, might not be correct anymore, but certainly when I worked there, was that the Rolls-Royce Motor Company had to license the use of the Rolls-Royce logo off Rolls-Royce PLC. So the Rolls-Royce PLC that I worked for, most people will recognise them as from aircraft engine, engines when you go on a plane and go on a holiday and all of that. I didn't work in the aero division. I worked in the industrial sector and the nuclear sector and latterly the marine sector. So 10 years in Rolls-Royce, I think you rose very quickly within that organisation, it's fair to say. Now, what sort of positions did you hold whilst you were there? I started out as a software engineer, very junior software engineer, and worked on some really exciting projects whilst doing that. I, I expressed an interest to broaden my career and, and moved into a, a commercial division. I was very fortunate in that role that my manager had previously been the area manager for a Rolls-Royce office in Tokyo. And having made it clear to him my aspiration to work overseas, he very kindly put me forward for, for that role, which I got. So, and How long were you in Japan for? Just under three years. Yeah, did that. And I would say that that was probably a life-changing experience for me. But it's one of those things that you look back on and say, yeah, when I went into that, I was a different person when I came out of it. How so? I would say that it gave me a business education. It gave me a Japanese business education, actually. And is that a good business education to have? A Japanese one? Aren't some of the companies a bit slow to make decisions, aren't they? Very male orientated. Do the, do the men you know, get onto the Tokyo trains at 8 o'clock in the morning and get home at 8 o'clock at night and you know, very slow progression? It doesn't, doesn't seem like the sort of Silicon Valley fast paced business world of other countries maybe? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point and, and culturally all of the things you just said are spot on but in terms of understanding how business works and the kind of things you need to, to do to really make a business work uh, that's really what I'm alluding to in terms of it being a business education and you're quite right yeah I've, I've been pushed onto, onto trains jammed in like sardines I, I was there pretty much every day and yes you do work late and of course, being a representative of a predominantly UK business, which Rolls-Royce mostly was in those days, the time difference being eight or nine hours, depending on the time of year, would mean that by about five o'clock in the afternoon, when one would hope you were winding down, the phone would start ringing from the UK and you could very easily do another half a day in the office. I can understand why it sort of taught you business, but you know, drilling into that, you know, what was it about the way the Japanese did it other than the long hours, which sort of forms 
Guy Phoenix, the business person? Relationships, for sure. Relationships, in one word. Their approach, I mean, their approach is, is clearly different to, to Western approach, but ultimately, everything they do is geared towards building relationships. And that's something you have to learn very quickly if you're working in Japan or indeed dealing with, uh, with Japanese business people. You will have meetings with them all day long and you might feel that you're not getting anywhere, as, as you alluded to earlier. It, do, it does seem to be quite, quite ponderous and quite slow. And that's simply because of their, their whole approach of uh, building up a consensus. No one likes to go too, too quickly in Japan. And they all want to make sure they're, they're going together as a team. So we, we may view it in Western eyes as it being too slow and bureaucratic, but what they're actually doing is making sure the team are together and going forward together with, with the approach. So there's that aspect of it. And then the other thing is that if you go out socially, well, it's not if you go out socially, when you go out socially, because it's essential to forming the relationships, you'll have a dinner and that will all be very convivial. And then typically you will then go to a karaoke bar. Anyone who's ever experienced karaoke in Japan will, will know that it's very different to our experience of karaoke in the West, where we, we have a bit of fun and we, we can be slightly about, embarrassed about it. It's quite the opposite. It, it's very serious and no one will ridicule you for standing up and being dreadful, which I was. <laughs> and is there a particular dreadful moment of Phoenix, the singer in Japan that you know you really ought to tell us about? And <laughs> this will be the first I, time. I did it my way. <laughs> this will, it's much, much worse. Uh, this will be the first time I've, I've actually um, admitted this in public. Do I need to turn this microphone <laughs> off at this point? We'll decide if it can go out afterwards. Go ahead, so, yeah. so I was in one particularly turgid session where, uh, with the greatest respect to some of, uh, to some of my Japanese colleagues, they will, they will often choose to sing songs which are quite maudlin and uh, kind of woe is me kind of, kind of songs. And uh, I was getting a bit fed up with that. I said, we've got to liven this up. So I, I called the, the, the Mama Sano over. I said, Can, have, we, have we got any Elvis or anything like that? And so she yeah, I don't know. So she, that's our great hand dog. Put that on, I'll do that. I'll be fine. So on comes hand dog. And they are, oh, yeah, Phoenix Sun, off you go, off you go. So I'll go up. And they're all getting really excited about it. So I'm getting quite excited because they're getting excited. We're getting the whole place going. So when you kick into Elvis's chorus of, you ain't nothing but a hand dog. Um, I decided I would jump up to do an Elvis turn, forgetting, of course, I'm six foot, whereas most Japanese are at least uh, six inches shorter than me. The ceiling was very low, and I promptly knocked myself out. <laughs> <laughs> and w woke up in hospital? Or what no, I woke up a couple of minutes later, and they'd got a glass of Suntory whiskey waiting for me, so all was good. <laughs> it sounds to me that that is uh, similar to the scenes in Lost in Translation with Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson which I think is one of your favourite films. Uh, it, it is. I, would, I, if, I think if, if pressed, and of course anything like that is emotive and it depends on your mood, but I would probably say if someone asked me what's your favourite film ever, I'd say Lost in Translation. And that's yeah. why we bonded when we last spoke, because it's that is also my favourite film and you're the only other person <laughs> who said it's their favourite film. It doesn't even score very high on uh, IMDb, I don't think, Lost in Translation, but uh, what does everybody else know about you know, the, the films? So uh, after your stint in Japan, uh, where to next? I mean, surely anywhere else is pretty boring in comparison to Japan. Yeah, well, Rolls-Royce brought me back, much, much to my chagrin that there had been a potential opportunity in, in the South Pacific, which was quite alluring, but they wanted me to come back and do a proper job in their words. So that's when I joined the Marine Division and became a worldwide head of marine sales and contracts, which was the, the, probably the longest job I held and the last job I held before moving on. Where was that based? Uh, that was based at Anstey in Coventry, near Coventry. So um, you, you were sent to Coventry very literally. I was literally sent to Coventry, yes. <laughs> and at that stage, as sort of head of the marine division, yeah. you know, how far off were you from the board of Rolls-Royce? Well, I wasn't uh, head of marine because I had a boss who was. Uh, Martin Duckworth, who's sadly no longer with us, um, he reported to another gentleman who was on the main board. I was getting up there. And you didn't f fancy climbing the greasy pole? Because I know that the next bit of your story is you, you pivot into a completely different sector. Yeah. E everyone likes the look of the next rung up the ladder, of course. But by that point, I'd reached the conclusion that I didn't want to be in one company all my life. I wanted to go and try something different. 
and at, at, it was about that time that the dot com boom came along. So and early nineties. No, we went early to late nineties. Sorry, yeah, late, 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 late nineties. Late nineties. Yeah, and I decided when I was at university, it was kind of like the whole boom of the Thatcher years and all of that, and the the stock market had been quite alluring, particularly as someone who was taking maths. And I decided I'd be a good boy for mum and dad and complete my degree. And I, I, I didn't regret it, but I often look back and, you know, you wonder what if. And, and I, I always told myself, look, if ever something like that comes up again, just do it. And so the dot-com boom came along. So I got in touch with a dot-com company and, uh, and I joined them. Just um, like that. You just what, emailed and said, well, if you could have emailed, I suppose you would have rang back in those days maybe <laughs> and said, yeah. hi, I'm the the deputy head of sales of the Marine Division of sure. Rolls-Royce. Can I have a job or whatever the title was? That's how you got it. I, I can't remember the exact mechanics, but it was pretty much like that. And uh, I think, frankly, the dot coms were all, were all uh, growing so rapidly they would just grab anyone at those, in, in those days. But it was uh, it was fortunate I had a good CV behind me to come on in. Sure. And you know what was this dot com business doing? They were effectively trying to sell, uh, buy and sell machinery online, uh, any kind of uh, equipment or machinery online. So Amazon, which, essentially, for machines. Yeah, which, which now, of course, just sounds like, well, well so what? Um, but then, of course, this was cutting edge stuff and everyone was trying to carve out a niche and, and that this whole new approach to markets was like any new approach to markets, sorting, it out, sorting itself out messily and with contradiction. But yeah, that's what those guys were doing. And what was your role within the dot-com company? To foster relationships with corporations who were offloading machinery and equipment so we could set up a, a second-hand machinery hub online. I know it didn't end well. <laughs> Tell us why it ended more in tears than it did well, end in sort well, of pots of cash. Well, it, was, it wasn't so much that it ended in tears, and, and I haven't looked for a while, but I'm pretty sure they're still going concern, although in a, in a very different kind Good. of business uh, model now. But to be perfectly, perfectly candid about it, working Rolls Royce was great, but I didn't have a great m- amount of savings behind me as a result. As you know, you work in corporate life, and you know there are pros and cons. One of the cons is maybe it's there's, it's not a great great way of putting a lot of savings behind you. So the idea behind the dot com was, of course, you got you got stock options, and there was one sunny sunny morning where my stock options went to seven figures but regrettably you're tied in for a certain period before you can realize them. And in that interim period was when the stop, the, uh, the, the dot-com crash came about. Um, what happened to you? Nothing at all, but I quickly realized that I'm on an even lower salary here than I was at Rolls-Royce, which was a conscious decision because of the stock options. And now the stock options are not gonna happen, so it's time to go back to reality. Had you stayed? Would you have realised those stock options? No. No chance? No. Even though they're still going today? Yeah, they're, they're, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to press you on that. That's all right. So after, yeah. what would that be, a year at a dot-com company? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, 18 months, I can't remember. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Where to next in this um, fascinating journey? I uh, applied for a job at uh, GEC Alstom, railway company, railway business in the UK, and, and they appointed me as their commercial director in the UK. Because Japanese trains run on time, and therefore you can make the British <laughs> trains work. Is, is that the logic? <laughs> I don't think that was necessarily the logic, but I think because you didn't make them run on time. So, um... <laughs> I think because. Um, they're, they're not just a UK business, they're, they're selling uh, parts and trains and all of that internationally. There's, there's, there's always that international element. And uh, I think they took the view that at that point in my career, I was, I was someone who was capable of being parachuted pretty much. Someone actually said this to me, we can parachute you into a country and we know you'll sort out whatever's going on or you know, it, it won't be a sink or swim, you'll swim. So it was that kind of idea, I think. So a lot of air miles during this period of time. Yeah, and uh, surprisingly rail miles as well, not that such a thing exists, it's a pity it doesn't. (laughs) It it, it doesn't, absolutely. So that, that, I think, brought you to Yorkshire, is that right, this time with the train companies? That job didn't, um, but that was at the point I decided I would now strike out on my own. And so I looked for an acquisition uh, and I was able to achieve that in, in 2004. And that is when I did move to Yorkshire. And what did you buy? I bought a small diesel generator distributor. As you do. Yeah. So Guy, you bought this 
company in 2004, this diesel generator, whatever it would Distrib- be, distributor. distributor. Yep. Thank you for helping yep. me out there. Now, how did you choose a business? Because I know you're in the rail world, yes, yeah, sure, and do Rolls Royce. I can see some logic in it, but you know, what was so enticing about this business sort of back in 2004? It's a really good question, and I, I, we had a, a business advisor on board with us, and, and I, I set them some, some criteria of the kind of business I, I was looking for. One, I had to be able to afford to buy it, I was kind of pretty key. But also, I said, I, I would like to have it an export arm to it, because I've got really good export experience by this point in my career, so it would be great if it, if it had that. And also, it, it needs to be broadly in engineering of some description, and so... Uh, diesel generators, okay, they're, they're certainly not up there in terms of high tech that you'd see at Rolls Royce PLC or indeed at, at GC Alstom, but you know, it's engineering, I understand it. And this business had, was about 50 50 UK ex- and uh, uh, export, so it, it fitted the bill. And with our advisors, we were able to get financing uh, from, the bank, from the banks. I have to say, in those days, uh, money was flowing easily, so it wasn't a huge challenge to, to get financing to achieve a, a, a management buyout, um, a leverage management buyout of the business to allow the, the owner to exit and retire. And how many sort of staff did this company have when you bought I, it? I think they must have had about 10 or 11 staff, something like that, yeah. So this is like 15 years ago, so this is your first business purchase. Yes. You've had a recent one, that's a month ago, in fact this month. So you know, talk to me about what you can about that period of time, because I think it's five years that you've owned sure. um, this business. I, w- I was all about growing it, and so... Why are you all about growing it rather than taking a, you know, as much profit out of it as you could? Because isn't that the way the capitalism always goes, isn't it? Is that the, the GDP must always be rising, We've, the company must always be growing. It seems like this is the way we're sort of, it's ingrained in us to do so. It is. Because I always ask a lot of business coaches and business owners I've had on this podcast, why do you want to grow it? And usually I get exactly the same reaction that you just sure, gave me. Yeah. I haven't really thought about it, but that's just the way it is. It's like, you know, why does the, the moon, why is, why is the moon where it is? This sort of thing, it was, because it's there. Sure. Sort of answer. Yeah. Uh, my, my answer is straightforward. Um, I would be bored if I just sat, sat in there and it ticked along. I would simply be bored. That's my answer. Okay, yeah, because you strike me as a man who gets bored quite easily. <laughs> and that's not a criticism, it's just an observation. Sure. And a giggle suggests that other people may have said something similar to you previously. So during this period of non-boredom, of growth, you know, where was it, I mean, did you go from 11 staff to, you know, what, what happened? Did, did the staff sure. numbers stay the same? We, we, we grew through, uh, we grew organically, because um, there's a big construction boom going on in the UK in particular, and in Africa. So because of the UK construction boom, new buildings, new commercial buildings, pretty much all of them need generators, standby generators, so there was a, a huge point market. And in Africa, which is our major export market in the Middle East to, little, uh, to, to a smaller extent, there's a big market for generators as well. Uh, particularly in Africa at that time, with the, the boom in mobile te- telephony, every single mobile mast needs two generators. Uh, and so we were fortunate that we had a, a, a strong distribution base in both East and West Africa who would order batches of generators from us at a go. So we're able to grow organically thanks to, to both of those, in, those industrial sectors growing terrifically and tremendously at the time. So there was that and there was, we also uh, achieved a, a couple of other acquisition, acquisitions as well. There was a small acquisition we did which frankly didn't work out. Um, it brought a few more customers, customers to us but it didn't achieve the kind of growth we'd hoped. And then there was a larger acquisition we did which was a similar company to ours but they were much more focused on the aftermarket rather than uh, the, sale, the sale of the actual equipment. They were a perfect fit for the business. And, and that allowed us to grow through all of that that I've just described over five years. It allowed us to increase the turnover nine or tenfold. And uh, we had about, I think, about 55 people in, on the team. That was incredible growth in that period of time. Yeah. yeah well, well done to you. And then, obviously, all the good things come to an end. Yes, they do. It takes it to about 2009. Yeah. You know, what was your next step? Yeah, I think having probably sold-ish around about this time. Um, well, uh, in, in 2008, we had the financial crash, and that's when the expression of 
banks giving you an umbrella when the sun is shining and taking it away when it starts raining really hit home because we'd, we'd conducted a, a, manage, uh, a leverage uh, management buyout, which to put it into plain English, English meant we took out a huge loan in order to buy the business. With uh, personal guarantees? Yeah, and the bank wanted the money back and they wanted it back now. Ouch. Yes. So through uh, a very painful process, we were able to refinance the business, but the process was frankly so painful that it took the wind out of my sails and I decided I had, I had, had enough and I exited. Fair enough. But no doubt you weren't sort of twiddling your thumbs you know, in this next period of your life. You know, you know, how did you end up getting to Harrogate? Because um, this Harrogate is not a featured thus far, I think yours has a little bit, but how did, where did Harrogate fit into all uh, this? Well, uh, th the business was based uh, near York and uh, so I was living in York and then I, I met my girlfriend um, who was living in Harrogate and so I moved to Harrogate um, once things became you know, reasonably serious. And you're still with Jane to this day, I think. I am, yes. But you, you divide your time, a bit like Richard Branson, who I know that you've met, I'm name dropping on purpose, <laughs> between you know, Yorkshire he, and the he, British he Virgin Islands. He probably doesn't know he met me, by the he way. Probably, he may not know that, but <laughs> you've certainly met him. But you divide your time between Yorkshire and the British Virgin Islands. I mean, the, how lucky are you? <laughs> how did you find yourself um, with a relationship with the British Virgin Islands? Uh, well, quite simply, having ex exited, I, had, um, I didn't have anything to do, so I was trying to figure out what to do next. And uh, I knew I, I wanted to do a bit of leisure time because I had just worked ridiculous hours and uh, there had been no play, uh, despite your description of me as a playaholic, uh, during the, the previous five years. And Jane was in a similar situation that uh, she, she'd been made redundant and was looking for a job. And she, she said to me one day, so look, I've been offered an interview with this company the interview is in Bristol, but the job's in the British Virgin Islands. That's well, you know, may as, well, may as well go to the interview. Fine, of course, whatever. And so she came back and said, well, yeah, okay. And a few days later, yeah, they, they want to see me again and they're serious. And, uh, and I'm ashamed to admit that we had to pull out the atlas to find out where the British Virgin Islands <laughs> were. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and we're looking at it. So, oh, hang on a sec, it's the Caribbean. That sounds all right. So I've got to be honest, we didn't take it seriously. I said, look, I, I, I don't think this is for real. And nor did she. And I said, let's, let's smoke them out. And I said, okay, say to them you'd like to make an inspection visit to the British Virgin Islands to, meet, to see the office and meet your boss and that you want your boyfriend to come with you because obviously he's got to be happy with the whole thing as well. Makes sense. Yeah, so I thought, yeah, that's it. We won't hear from them again. And they just came straight back and said, book your flights. So, <laughs> yeah, bluff well and truly called. So uh, off, we went. off we went and, of course, we liked it. Jane got her job, of course. Just because it's the British Virgin Islands, it doesn't give any British person status at all. You have to get, you have to have status there of some description. And so, if you want to work, you have to have a work permit. Otherwise, sling your hook. Uh, simple as that. And so, I had to figure out how to normalise my status. And the way I chose was to apply for uh, and luckily receive a trade license. Trade license to do what? Uh, well, I, my first trade license was to conduct uh, digital marketing and uh, software distribution. So that was what the trade license was for. And then I, uh, I started from scratch building that business, um, having spent six months working out how to do that and doing a lot of sailing in the, in the Caribbean regattas. Hence the playaholic <laughs> description, which I think is fair as well. <laughs> You've underplayed it a little today. But is it sort of you know, Brit going out to the British Virgin Islands? You know, just could you, what was it like the first time you got there? You know, describe it to us. I've, I've, I've been to Cuba, but I think that's very different, I'm assuming, for the BVI. Yeah, it is, yeah. You know, just you know, paint a picture for me, please. Well, well, the scenery would be similar to Cuba, a apart from, of course, if you're in Havana and you've got all of those, those, old, those old buildings that seem to be in a time warp, and, and they're all very beautiful. But, of course, that's all uh, Spanish colonial influence. Whereas the BVI, regrettably, a lot, a lot of the heritage is, go is gone because as financial services has increased the wealth of the country, people have been able to build solid buildings, steel reinforced concrete and all of that, which I know we'll get on to talk about this, served them well in 2017. But there, there's, there's no high rises or anything like that. They're all uh, low rise and um, you've still got the old, the old street in, in uh, Road Town 
where you can still see some of the old colonial buildings and, and things like that. And it's just generally, they're just generally beautiful islands. I'd say the main island of Tortola, which is the biggest where, where industry is, is located mostly, there, there's some, it, it's a working island uh, mostly. Tourism tends to go to the other islands and there's 65 other islands, so there's plenty of places for them to go to. 65, I would have guessed yeah. two if you were to ask me. Yeah. 65, good news, or 66, I guess, yeah. w- w- would be. Well, well, it, it, no one, it, it, it's a, it seems to be a bit of a moot point. 66 seems to be the common, everyone will go, yeah, well, okay, it's 66, we think. <laughs> and the, the business that you started, this digital marketing business, what yes. was it called? What is it called? <laughs> I, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, I called it Phoenix Caribbean. And I'm, Phoenix I, Caribbean, I'll yes. repeat that. Yes, yes. I like it. And sound I'm, like a film. I'm slightly embarrassed about it because it sounds, to me, people who name their business after themselves, it kind of sounds egotistical to me, to be honest. And it was not done for reasons of ego. It was done because I knew my email address would be my first name and then at Phoenix Caribbean. And so every time I emailed my friends in England, it would be an immediate reminder that I now lived in the Caribbean. That was, that was the rationale for doing it. It was basically a two fingers to my friends. Yeah, childish and but funny. Indeed, yeah. indeed, until they all you know, defriended me. I bet they did. I bet <laughs> they did. And so t- talk me through the, the next stage in your b- business journey. You've got your b- ability to trade in the BVI. Mm-hmm. You have your new company named after yourself and it grows and you now have companies in Harrogate. Explain the link. It, be, it very quickly became apparent to me that if I was going to have a digital marketing agency, I needed some kind of website development capability. And I could build websites myself. I'm, I was, after all, I'm a software engineer by training. Uh, it wasn't something I wanted to do myself, didn't particularly uh, interest me. So, okay, how am I going to get this kind of ability? So I can either recruit or I can look at maybe finding an, another business to do that. And fortunately, uh, at that time, I heard about a company where the owner was, was looking to sell the company and, and, leave, and leave the British Virgin Islands. And I didn't contact them because I was concerned that, well, okay, if they're the founder and they're the owner and they leave, you, they're actually just leaving you holding not much, not very much. But I kept hearing about them. So in the end, I thought, you know what, just ring them up. So I did. And uh, it turned out that, yes, they did want to move to the UK, but they still wanted to remain involved in the business. They would still do that kind of work. And of course, the nature of web development and the internet, how it's progressed these days, means you can, in fact, develop websites sat in your, in your front room, as long as if, if you really feel that way inclined. So that started to make a bit more sense. So I bought out the, uh, the majority shareholder, who was a silent, a silent partner, and we started to grow the business, but not just the website business. It quick, quickly became apparent that they had an, a small IT arm to the business as well. And so we started to grow that. And it, it turned out that that was really a really fortunate time to decide to do something like that. Because with financial services growing in, in, this, in, in the country, financial services is, uh, is about 80% of GDP. All of these small businesses, small as we would see them, are part of global businesses, but they all need local IT support. And because they are parts of global companies, uh, they want professional, first class, I would say, world class support from all of their suppliers. And we were one of the first companies in the BVI to be, to be able to do that from an IT perspective. And that allowed us to really grow. But tell us how this segues into Yorkshire again. Sure. Well, um, as we were able to grow and fortunately be successful, I started to look at how we could grow the team. And, and it's quite it's quite tough to actually recruit in, in the BVI. It may sound ridiculous to, to listeners who've been to the Caribbean or see all those beautiful pictures of the Caribbean. It's very different living and working there than it is going on holiday there, just like it is anywhere else for that matter. You have a romanticized view from being on holiday. But we, we would recruit people sometimes from, from outside of the country and they would come in and first couple of months, oh, this is terrific. Um, but then it would dawn to them that they're not on holiday. And that you know, you know, you're living in the Caribbean. It's very different to living in in the UK or the US or or wherever they've come from, and they would leave. So you need a particular mindset to live and work there. And and of course, it's a small country, so being able to find local talent is all, is also a challenge. So both of those factors made me look at, at another acquisition. 
So uh, I looked at one in the States and that fell through. I sulked for 24 hours and then I got up um, and uh, thought, well, let's, let's have, a, have a rethink. And I had a look in the UK where I hadn't looked before. And lo and behold, there was an IT business up for sale uh, in Ripon, 10 miles up the road from Harrogate. So didn't think it was real, thought this can't be possible. And in 2015, I bought CCS 2000. Very good. And how many people did it have when you purchased CCS 2000? Uh, CCS 2000 had about the same number of people it has today. So, oh no, that's not quite right. It's, it had, let's think, I think five people were in CCS and we're at eight today, but yeah. And therefore you're providing support, I understand it, for businesses with the CCS team in Ripon and also the team in British Virgin Islands. Sure. Well, I mean, we, we, that must be the only connection between Ripon and the British Virgin Islands, I, I, I guess, or Harrogate British Virgin Islands, <laughs> for that matter. There can't be many sort of two, two locations where there's sure. ones in the Caribbean. <laughs> it's a great story. Um, well, 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 thank you. It, it might be the case. And uh, we're quite gratified when uh, the, uh, the governor of the British Virgin Islands actually came to celebrate um, our, our BVI business, which is called Fresh Mango, um, its 10th anniversary last year. And one of the first things he said was, you know, this is one of the first examples of a BVI company actually buying a business from the mother country. And he actually said, <laughs> you're, 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 like, you're like Tartar. I said, yeah, we're not quite on that scale, Governor, but thanks, I appreciate the sentiment. Tartar steel. Yes. <laughs> I can see the similarities there a little bit. Yeah. You know, without the strikes outside the uh, smelting. Indeed. Indeed. The, yeah. 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 So, so yeah, you buy CCS uh, four sure. years ago, and you know, talk me through these last four years up to buying a, um, a business. And I, I think there's an event in 2017 that really requires some uh, uh, in-depth discussion. There was. I mean, it, as it turned out, it might sound ridiculous, but we actually had to bring CCS up to the standards of Fresh Mango. You would think that a UK business would be at a higher standard than a Caribbean business. I mean, you would. Naturally, I would. you would think that. Yeah. But because of the nature of the, the customers that we have in the British Virgin Islands, demanding this first-class, world-class support. It, it, made, it made Fresh Mango, without us realising it, really, really good. <laughs> and when we took over CCS, we realised we were better than CCS, and so we need to bring CCS up to standard. You can't do that overnight, but you can do it, and we achieved that. And I'm pleased we did, because uh, two years later, on September 6, 2017, a date I'll never forget, Hurricane Irma, the strongest, biggest Atlantic storm in history went directly over the British Virgin Islands and literally wiped out our business. As in the premises were destroyed? Yes. yes. Along with pretty much every other building in the country not necessarily being wiped out, but I don't think a build, there was a building that did not sustain damage. However, most of them being concrete helped immensely. Not hugely, but immensely. At least the, the physical structure was still standing. Most of the roofs went. Hence the working book title at the moment of Get Up. Yes. So I can't imagine being in a hurricane or even a country that's you know, hit by repeated hurricanes, but your business is destroyed. How did you get up from there? I wasn't there when the hurricane hit. And I would even now give anything to have been there when the hurricane hit. I could sit, I was here. I was at CCS on a business trip. Did you know it was coming? Oh yeah, that, that's the thing about hurricanes, you know they're coming. I thought but so. But they nearly always go north, as we put it. We wait, we're, you're, you're watching the track and you're waiting for some kind of wind shear to take it north of the islands, which usually happens in the British Virgin Islands. This one didn't, it came off Cape Verde and it just kept coming in a straight line and it just kept getting bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger. It's, uh, it hit Barbuda. We couldn't get any news out of Barbuda the next day. Um, so I was in Skype communication with Jane about, you know, PEP and all of that, etc., etc. And then it hit and it was three days before I was able to ascertain uh, if she was alive. And she was. Yeah, so, yeah, all, all, all was well in the end. But yeah. how, did, how did she survive the hurricane? The, the house was really strong. It's a concrete house. And fortunately, we had a, a concrete roof. Most people have t tin, tin roofs, you know, the kind of aluminium um, yes. kind of stuff, and they just went. And the moment the roof went, the house went. So w was she shielding other people in the house? Uh, one of our, our senior technician was there on a technical visit, so he was in the house with her, and uh, as was our dog. Were the windows put in? 
Oh, well, no. I mean, everything was barricaded off. You have shutters and, and all of that kind of thing. The back doors did get ripped open at one stage and they had to spend 35 minutes literally holding them there whilst the tail end of the hurricane went through. My goodness. So a few days before you know, and then probably an emotional phone call when they sure. in communication. And then you what, got on the plane, get back there as soon as you could? No, it was four months before I could go back. Why is that? The, well, the airport was shut and, and wiped out. And then uh, the British, uh, British Armed Forces did a magnificent job of coming in. The Royal, Fleet that's all, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary that's always on standby during the season had stood off whilst the hurricane went through and then immediately came in. But whilst they've got great resources and, 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 great, and, and great guys, the whole country was flattened. So it, needed, it really needed the cavalry. So HMS, HMS Ocean was on standby in Gibraltar. And so she was basically provisioned with everything that was possible and steamed over and arrived about 10 or 12 days later to um, really get the recovery underway. And they did a fantastic job, but it was months before the airport reopened. And I'll, I'll tell you straight, I've, I've, because of my Rolls-Royce days, I've got a lot of, of friends who are either military or ex-military. And, uh, and I rang them all up, begging them to, to find me a jump seat in a Hercules to, to get me back onto the island. And, um, and they refused. And they quite rightly refused because A, I'd be taking up a seat of someone who could actually add some value to the recovery. And B, I would have just been another mouth to feed when they didn't have any food to feed people with. So yeah, they were right to, to, put, to just stop my naturally selfish instincts of wanting to go back and help. Because you want to go back and help, but they're right. I wouldn't have been able to help. So Jane and your colleagues then yes. survived on, let's call it handouts from... Well, I mean, they, they, they survived on a massive stock of tinned food that we'd built up <laughs> in, in, the, in the storeroom, yeah. So four months later, eventually you're allowed back, and, yes. and during that four months, was the premises closed, no business undertaken? The, the building was destroyed, but we were able to move in with, uh, first of all, temporarily we, we moved in with, with one of our clients whose building was hurricane-proof and they'd, they'd sort of survived. Keep in mind there's no electricity at this point, therefore there's no internet, there's, there's basically nothing. But we can start to recover. And what I did was I set up CCS as our communication hub for all of our clients. Now, of course, most of our clients had been taken out, but because they are uh, global, typically global clients with offices in Hong Kong or London, the Channel Islands and so on and so forth, they did the same thing as me. They were taking on the work of their client base. So I was, I was able to communicate with them as well. And I think after about a week, uh, Jane discovered there was one mobile phone mass that was operational in, in Roadtown and it was by a, an establishment called The Pub. And guess what they do? <laughs> um, and, and, they, and so literally the team would walk, because the roads were smashed up, would walk and convene at the pub at, at nine o'clock on a morning. And they would crowd around this mobile phone on speaker. And I would be at this end relaying all of the requirements from our customer base. So, okay, you need to go and see so-and-so. You need to go and see so-and-so, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how we started the recovery literally on foot sometimes the technicians would be wading through flood water going and knocking on doors uh, finding out because the client base wanted to know what status their, B their bvr offices were in and then from that we could start to help them plan now i'll be honest there were some dark days i, it, I, I could not see a way through i could not see how it would be possible to recover and and then it was only when the general manager of one of our clients, she got evacuated and she uh, texted me, she was back in the UK, and, rang, and so we had a phone call. Uh, and she started talking about that they were going to establish a temporary office in Antigua with a view to moving back in 12 months time. And that they wanted to just repurchase all of the equipment that had been lost uh, through us. And then I suddenly thought, okay, we might be okay. Because imagine right. cash flow was beyond difficult at that time if you're paying wages and your clients yeah, aren't paying. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I, had to, I, I financed everything out my own, my own savings at that point, yeah. My goodness. So when was it that the business was back on even keel? Has it ever had sure. to well, 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 I got I got back four months later, which was just before Christmas, uh, and mercifully uh, electricity was restored at our house a week after that. So Jane had been without electricity for four months. 
And so the first thing we had to go and do, it turned out, was buy a new fridge, because the fridge had gone kaput, uh, which meant that we could actually buy um, food to put in a fridge and, and make a nice Christmas dinner, which we did. And then the, the first few months of the year, we then I looked for premises. We established new premises, bigger and better than the ones we'd had. And by that point, the, the recovery was in was really in you know, really going well. All our clients were starting to recover as well. And so by the end of 2018, um, it was business as usual. Very good. Well done. Which takes us nicely into how you've recently purchased a business in Leeds, yet another business to buy. <laughs> Sure. Well, clearly the, the 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 whole hurricane thing set us back. I mean, not in terms of um, it, it set us back for obvious reasons, but it was also a setback in my development plans for the company because I'd always had an eye on wanting to to establish a, a stronger presence in Yorkshire. Once we we knew we'd built CCS to the frankly world class levels that it, it operates at. And so I was actively looking for a business and was able to uh, negotiate and agree a retirement sale of a, of a similar sized company in Leeds just last week. Well done. Now, Guy, how many businesses have you bought? Do you know? <laughs> uh, I don't. Sorry. <laughs> Off the top of my head, I don't. When <laughs> someone answers a question that they don't know the number, that suggests that the number is, is high. And the number of offers you would have made over the years is you know, probably even times, whatever it is, times five or, or whatever. Now, do you have any tips for business people who are looking to buy a business? Is it just do your due diligence, get a lawyer and accountant, or is it more to it than that? I imagine you've got some tips. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you're right about all of the due diligence stuff. The first time you do it, you'll look at the professional advisor fees and you'll take a sharp inta- intake of breath if you don't pass out. They're worth it. They are absolutely worth every penny. Do not even consider skimping on it. Okay, get an advisor for your first deal. Okay. You mean as a business advisor, are you talking like lawyer advising? No, you'll need a lawyer as well to, to, to take you through the deal, but I'm talking about someone who can give you commercial advice as well and walk you through it. Because the most challenging thing is, particularly in a retirement sale, this is the vendor's baby. Okay. They've they've got pretty much a lot of their life invested in this business. Okay. And making sure they're comfortable and, and happy with it is probably the most challenging thing. You might say, well, hang on a sec, you know, they're going to get gazillions or, or X hundreds of thousands out of the deal. You know, what's the problem? It's not about the money. It's, in, it's, a, it's a 90% emotional decision for them. So uh, why would you need a business advisor to deal with what is simply a human, human question? I, that I, I don't understand. Because first time round, you might not recognise that. You might go into it in the rational way that I would have gone into it. It's like, well, you know, I'm bringing a big check, but what's your problem, mate? <laughs> but it's absolutely not like that. So you need someone to, to guide you and to, and, to, and to be the bridge between, you know, they will, they will have their moments where they'll say the deal is off and they will act as the intermediary and, and it's be a legal conduit. word. Yeah, conduit, thank you, would be a good word. But someone who, mediator, that's the word I'm looking for they would effectively be the mediator who will you know, bring the temperature down. And take a percentage of the deal? Yes. Okay, so first bit of advice, you heard it, heard it here, ladies and gentlemen, get a business advisor, but anything else that you would give in terms of buying businesses? Um... For sure. No, be, be sure of your reasons for doing it. Be absolutely clear on your reasons for doing it. Yeah, and and boil it down to you know well my reason my reason is X why okay then what, when you give your answer to that why well why just keep asking why until you distill it down to why you actually want to do it what are the reasons for doing it and if you can't look yourself in the mirror uh, and and give yourself straight a straight rationale for doing it then just pause sound advice and what advice would you give to people setting up or contemplating setting up their first business you know do you you know should anybody set up a business are we all cut out for it you know should you give it a go in the corporate world you know, any sort of pearls of wisdom from your long business career uh, sure what's the worst that can happen and what are you waiting for seriously I come across people a lot who are saying well you know I'm, I'm, in, I'm in this job and I'm not happy with it, so I'm thinking of setting up on my own and, and, and this, that and the other. But of course I've got all of these commitments and, and, and it's that, 
that of course is is the real fear that how are they going to meet their financial commitments for either themselves or their family and, and that kind of thing and that's absolutely le legitimate of course um, but what is the worst that can happen you go out and you try it the worst that can happen is it fails and you're bankrupted and you lose the house in the worst case but be careful how you do it don't you don't necessarily need to put everything on the line for it okay you don't necessarily need to have to do that if you think about it if you're starting up on your on your own then there's not necessarily that much financing required so make sure you've got enough savings in the bank to to see you through a certain amount of time and also set yourself a reasonable cutoff date year one is just going to be horrible there's no two ways about it. You won't have experienced anything like it. And you'll, you'll, every night you'll wake up thinking, why, 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 why am I doing this? But guess what? There'll be a year two and it'll be a bit better. And then there'll be a year three and that'll be a bit better. And then suddenly you wake up one morning thinking, actually, this is all right. Guy, I'm going to call you out on that because okay. I have said this point to a number of the business coaches who've been interviewed on the Harriet podcast when they give advice, not dissimilar to what you just said about setting up, you know, what's the worst that can happen, de-risk yourself, etc. It all sounds very uh, plausible to me, but is it not so that 80% of new businesses collapse in the first five years? So when you say what's the worst that can happen, you've only got a 20% chance of being around in five years' time. Yes. So even with those odds stacked against you, just go ahead with it. No, um, that, you, you're asking me what advice would I give to someone, to someone like myself, and it would be just go for it. Okay, well, think, why think, are you think, wired differently, though? You know, um, is there an entrepreneurial wiring that you and other people have that sort of sets you apart from others? I, I don't think so. I, I, think, I, I honestly don't think so. That's quite you've just given me a flashback to, to my, schools at my, my school days when I was head of the debate team we did some we did advice on on whether everything is preordained or or whether we're, we're all products of our environment I, I do think it's the latter and in fact I think I argued that side of it you, yeah you, you take your chances L let me put it this way if it's something you, you really think you want to do and in, and in one year, two years, three, and you go and do it, and in one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, it fails, if the 80% stat is correct. You tried, right? You tried. Would you rather be re retirement in 35 years time, looking back, thinking, what if I should have done that? Is that really what, what you want to be doing? And, and, and then spending those 30, 35 years just going through the motions. So. There are people who are very happy with that, and that's great. You know, good, you're happy, and that's ultimately the main thing in life, isn't it? Whereas if you've got this, this itch to scratch and this what if, what if, don't be that person when you retire who's going to be sat there thinking what if. Try it. I would summarise that as don't have a deathbed regret, I guess, yeah, is, I guess. is it in a, I guess, in a yeah. summary. I guess, yeah. Guy, what advice would you give to people who are running businesses over two sites. I mean, not just two sites for you, but two countries, two two continents. Sure. Um, well, the first thing you need to do need to do is to make sure that your uh, your IT and your telecommunications are integrated. So please come talk to me about that. Um, and after and after that shameless plug, quite okay. seri quite seriously, you need to uh, ensure that your processes and your systems are in place to allow you to do that. And so that's, and also the people, it's systems, processes and people. You could argue that's the same in any business, but it's particularly important when you're managing multi-site multi -site and multi-jurisdictional uh, companies. And once you've got those people in place and they're all trained and they understand the processes, etc., and you continue to improve your processes, as you should do in any business, uh, it, it, it falls into place actually, and, and everyone gets used to it. The, the most important thing is just getting people used to, uh, I, I don't like using the phrase, virtual working. So in other words, everyone's got a camera, everyone's got some kind of uh, video um, conferencing facility, be it Skype or Zoom or Skype for Business, one of those. And just getting used to, instead of going to the office next door and say, oh, can I just have a word, jumping onto a, a video conference call saying, oh, can I just have a chat? Yeah, most people don't do that. I know we don't do that in our office and I think we're quite good with tech sure so it's those kind of things it's, yeah the modern world indeed yeah. you are living it 
Now to networks. I ask all my businessy contacts about networks because not a day goes by that I'm not invited to one or two networking events in Harriet. I don't know how there are so many networking events, but you know, do you go to any you know, or what tips do you have uh, to people in Harrogate in relation to networks? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, on, on my business trips to the UK, I, I probably overdose on them because I'm, I'm trying to do as much oh, as, uh, as much overdose. as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think uh, I think the expression last week was that I was networked out by Friday night, um, having done five networking events that week. And which five did you do? Oh crikey! Which five did I do? Um, see that? See, I've slept since then. You must have done a B and I. I did do a B and I actually. Yes, I did do a B and I and B to B. I did a B to B. Network uh, North. Uh, I didn't do a Network North. I did a Profit Club. I think I did an Action Club, and there's one other that escapes me. Oh, it was uh, a, another B B to B at uh, Bradford Leeds Bradford Airport. They said they've got one going down there as well. And why do you overdose out on networks? Be- networking. Because I think we, 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 have, we have tried so many different marketing approaches to, for lead generation for the business to, as part of our organic growth aspirations. And I, I, th- I think it's not an exaggeration to say we've probably tried pretty much every, every marketing lead generation, every, every lead generation activity that, that, that there is in any marketing book. And the ones that are proving the most successful are through networking and building and coming back to building relationships. How very Japanese. So does. And the Japanese, would they have networking groups like this or would they just or way too sophisticated that society is sort of built upon these networks that it would seem preposterous to go to a BNI or a B2B? Uh, it's a good question. I, I don't know about modern Japan, whether they've, they've come with that, but they do naturally uh, network through their the, the conglomerate business groupings, the keiretsu, and then on a, on a, on a smaller level um, through their individual teams uh, and the way they, they, they work with their client base in the ways I've described previously. Um, and just, just as an aside, when I was there, we did set up our own little individual networking group called the 1066 Club, and it was comprised of expat, British expats in Japan and Japanese who had been expatriates in Britain. And we used to go to a, a restaurant, a, a, a British restaurant, which might sound like an oxymoron from those days, but there you go, it was called 1066. The day that Britain was invaded for the last time successfully. That's right. How out? Yeah. Guy, in your working life, you would have dealt with lots of banks, either when you were working for PLCs or when sort of acquiring businesses, selling businesses, or just for ordinary banking. My sense is that you have some tips for business people um, dealing with banks, and please be nice. <laughs> okay. O- obviously, I had an experience uh, with my, my the first business that I owned when the financial crash hit that, um, has, that has and will stay with me for the rest of my life in, in the way that the bank dealt with us. And I don't think I, I, I was alone in that experience. In fact, I, I saw a presentation at one of the networking events last week where what one guy stood up and was very open about his experience, in, 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 which was not dissimilar to mine. He wasn't as nice about them in his talk as I'm going to be in this discussion. Look, they, they perform a valuable function, particularly if you are in a startup position and you, and you do need finance. Go into it with your eyes open, though. Do not, do not sign guarantees which you're uncomfortable with and that keeping in mind the statistic that Andrew just gave you about the 80% failure rate. Think about that. If you do fail, how much are you in fact prepared to lose? Because be in no doubt, if you've guaranteed it, the bank will take it, okay? Because they're in business as well. And so uh, looking at it from, as a defender of the bank, which I'm not, they're in business, so they have to make money as well. And that's why they put those guarantees in place. So do it carefully, do it with your eyes open. Regrettably, these days, it's much more difficult to form a relationship with, with a bank because of the way they, they've structured themselves. And whilst they, I know they have relationship management managers, in my experience, typically, they will, on, they will only deal with bigger businesses because that, that's what they're going after. So if you're a small business, trying to get a relationship is, is a real challenge and to get someone to understand your business is a challenge. So just, just keep that in mind when you're doing it. But ultimately, do whatever you can 
to get yourself to a point where you're no longer dependent on the bank as soon as humanly possible. Uh, and from that point forward, don't take any more and uh, take on any more debt um, in, unless there's a really good opportunity and a genuine reason for doing it. For example, an acquisition that's a perfect strategic fit for you. I think that's sound advice. Yeah, it's, in a way, avoid banks as much as you can, other than for ordinary banking sort of functions. Um, very brave, but guy. As I come to the end of the podcast, you know what's next for you? You've got you know some of sixty years of probably acquiring businesses and so on. You know, are we going to see you on the Dragon's Den? I think. <laughs> are we going to see you at Necker Island with Richard Branson, which you haven't told us about? You know? <laughs> I've never been to Necker Island. Oh, actually. sorry. Uh, I think I, I, I met Sir Richard on on his his uh, his yacht in uh, at Sir uh, Wanham Marinas uh, many years ago. He, he kindly opened up the yacht uh, for people to come and have a nose around Necker Bell, and so that was quite nice. So, what's next? I've, I've, I've got to do some work to, to integrate the new business, which is, which is going to be great. That's um, IDT. IDT, that's right, in Leeds. So looking forward to that. Delighted to say that all of the staff have embraced the new ownership. They're, they're really excited, and so, and so I am as well. That's short term. Uh, I also am considering doing more with, with Phoenix Caribbean over here, rather than in, uh, just in the, in the Caribbean as well. I'm also about to launch a software as a service, um, which uh, we're very close to launching. I'd hoped to do it last week, but just um, when the, the front end website was presented to me a couple of days ago, there's, there's a few things that we just need to, to improve upon it. So that will be launched within the next few weeks. And then so, we'll see so where that takes us. You just say that flippantly. So SaaS, is it calls it software as a service? That's right. Yes. So what is the service? Uh, well, about uh, about five or six years ago at, at Fresh Mango, as as we started to grow, uh, one of the first things you need in a, in any IT business, if you're supporting customers, is some some system of uh, recording the support requests that's better than Excel, <laughs> and it needs to be a lot better than Excel. So we thought, well, okay, well, we need to get some software that's going to allow us to record, record tickets. And we really couldn't find anything that we, we, that we liked. There's plenty of commercial off-the-shelf software available, but all, all of it, would, we would need to compromise the way we operate the business in order to fit in with the software. We didn't like that. So thought, you know what, guess what? We've got a bunch of clever guys who can write software, so let's, let's write our own. So we did. And, and, it's, and, it's, and we started to use it and we started to uh, enhance it and improve it and all of that and get it operating as, as we needed it to operate. And so we then started to in increase its capability to the point that it's become a complete business management system. It's not just a ticketing system. It goes from everything from initial lead right the way through to you've won, won whatever it is, you've won the project. It, it can now either, you now then have a bunch of support tickets or projects for a particular customer and then we've gone even further and it can now integrate with the major accounting packages. So this holy grail that people are always looking for where you've got customer records in your CRM system, you've got customer records in your accounting system, you've got customer records here, there and everywhere. Typically businesses will have three or four different systems with the customer records. We've got a one-stop shop and we implemented it at CCS very successfully and, and again it's, it's continued to develop. So we've basically had a six year development cycle on this software and we know it's as bug free as software can be. I mean, to beta testing, it's, it doesn't even begin to describe it. And uh, thinking about it last year, and I think I was at a seminar and, or maybe reading a book where they talk about, if possible, sell a product that your competitors would buy. And it was one of those blinding, blinding flashes of the obvious moments, the light bulb went off. I thought, you know what? let's sell our IT support system. So that's going to be the software as a service that we will launch and we will market it to um, U UK IT businesses and US IT businesses to begin with and see where we go. And then there'll be an IPO and uh, <laughs> hopefully I get an invite to <laughs> Phoenix Island. Uh, there's, there's another 65 that <laughs> could, could be purchased. Well, you know where I am for the invites. Guy, it's been, again, a real pleasure interviewing you. Thank you for your time. And I uh, wish you the best of luck with the new business and the book and the movie when that actually comes out. <laughs> <laughs> and if Thank anybody's you. got the CCTV footage of the, the, the Japanese bar of some Englishman smashing his head during a rendition of 
hound dog well you can contact me and <laughs> delighted to share it thank you guy thank you very much indeed Andrew. it's a pleasure thank you